Well, um, uh, in your absence, John, we had been discussing a little bit about, uh, I guess, uh, you know, Tony was discussing uh, toward the end of, of the reading for this week, uh, they got into the differences between abstractions and versus ideals. Yes. And uh, there was... Uh, um i'm noticing that another word that barely appears in this book is positivist or positivism it mm -hmm. show, a variation of it shows up twice in the book um positivism is not something that I could necessarily define for us, although I, I think it's an important concept that I myself don't necessarily grasp, but the Frankfurt School talks about it a lot and um, other uh, um, others in the dialectical social ecology tradition or adjacent to it certainly think it's important. Um, Ochelon talks about it a lot, but um, surely that there's, there's something very conservative about um, the scientific apparatus I'm thinking of a slogan that the climate camp of London had. It was a big banner and it said, we come only armed with peer reviewed science. <laughs> and, you know, surely um, peer reviewed science is one of the things that, that we are armed with, but hopefully not the only thing. Um, and uh, I approach scientists much like I approach um, clergy in my mind, because both have important things to say, and yet both um, have a particular social role that we need to be wary of. And the higher up that they are, the the more maybe skeptical we might ought to be. Um, and I'm thinking of the role that certain scientists have played in left movements. James Hansen comes immediately to mind, and he's played. Uh, uh, I, I imagine everybody knows who he is, and you know he's he's played some extremely important roles in terms of uh, criticizing the scientific establishment and getting arrested at protests and bringing credibility to the climate justice movement. And yet he's also used his position to advance uh, nuclear power, carbon pricing, uh, various um, techno fixes that we would be um, highly critical of. So, um, you know, they're, they're, <laughs> they're writing within the scientific profession and, um, and we can't forget that for sure. So I guess to add to Tony's question, do they do they solve the problems that they're identifying? Um, I would I would add to that, or maybe um, uh, modify that question a bit. You know, are they um, going beyond positivism? That's the question I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, they're not positivists. I mean, they're far from it. I mean, I don't even know what in, they say that anyone would think would be positivism. You know, positivism goes back to a French uh, philosopher named Auguste Comte, who came up with a theory called positivism, which was a scientific theory. Uh, I mean, you know, they're also the logical positivists uh, in the 20th century. They're philosophers like A.J. Ayer, uh, who, you know, kind of inherited the positivist tradition. Um, I, I don't really see any reason why anybody needs to mention positivism very much. I think, I think, uh, you know, that, could, I, could I say a little about what I see of value in what they're doing? Please. Because, I, you know, I, I, to me, not mentioning positivism is just not even it isn't really a criticism in some ways because it's 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 kind of arbitrary uh which example someone takes because they 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 have a critique of reductionism and a, a lot of what people criticize in positivism would come under the category of the kind of reductionism that they're that they're attacking um 
they're they're attacking a certain kind of analytical approach that's reductionist, and I think they do a good job of it. But so so um, I just wrote down too much uh, going through this to, to even mention most of it. But I, I found the discussion from around 133 to 139 to be very, very helpful as uh, a summary of a lot of what they're trying to get at. And then around the middle, there's this discussion of community ecology and what they see as, as the merits of uh, a, a good version of community ecology. And then at the end, on 156 to 159, uh, I think there's a good... Uh, summary of some of what uh uh, uh you know they're they're we should i think we should look at what they say dialectical materialism is and their version i i think uh 40 years ago it was much more acceptable for people to talk about being dialectical materialists um you know we we read a book i think it was this group that read um um Zizek's, uh, we, didn't we do the, the one on, on dialectical, it's his new formulation of dialectical materialism? Uh, yeah, we did. Um, the um, Absolute recoil. Absolute recoil. But, but you know, um, Zizek almost uses it in an ironic sense now. He, he says, you know, there's so many problems with the term dialectical materialism. He kind of defiantly uses it, but they're using it in a kind of matter of fact way that, it, you know, it is to them a, a reasonable philosophy as, as they interpret it. So um, on page 133, you know, they state really what their, what their, uh, their project is, that their, their, uh, their, their, they're attacking two things. Um, they talk about confusions, the confusion between reductionism and materialism. You know, they're attacking reductionism, they're defending materialism. The confusion between idealism and its abstraction, and they're attacking idealism and defending abstraction. And the confusion between statistical and stochastic. And, um, well, they, they, they attack a lot of uh, statistical kinds of analysis and they, they defend this idea that the stochastic and the, the, the uh, deterministic can be reconciled. So if one commits oneself to a totally reductionist program, uh, there are all kinds of problems that, that follow. That wasn't what I was looking for. What I was looking for is that uh, right there they, they say that they're, they're trying to refute a kind of mechanistic materialism and also a dialectical idealism. So I, you know, I think it's really important to see how they try to do this. Now, what, what a lot of people would include under positivism would be a mechanistic or reductionist materialism. So that's, that's what they're attacking. Um, so uh, one of the things that I think is really valuable in their in their chapter here, or chapters, is uh, their discussion of parts and wholes, and uh, the complexity of our whole part analysis, and, and really the dialectic between parts and wholes. And I, I, I hope I can maybe you know, it's, it's, there's so much of it, but there, there's some very good quotes in here where they, where they state um, uh, what, what this is about. For instance, 134, about the difference between organism, you know, they, they want to overcome the organism environment dualism. Envir organisms are environments and environments sometimes are organisms. So it's often forgotten that the seedling is the environment of the soil and that the soil undergoes great and lasting evolutionary changes as a direct consequence of the activity of plants growing in it. Um, so, so uh, you know, that's one of the things they're looking at. They're looking at uh, mutual interactions, dialectical interactions, both between different organisms, between uh, different species, and also between wholes and parts and parts and wholes. So on, on 135, they, uh, I think a valuable part 
I mean, I, I've looked at some of the things I wrote a long time ago, and I, I really, even though I read this, I, I really didn't read it carefully enough. I mean, I would have been helped a lot by spending more time on this book because I, I read some things that I wrote back in a, a confused uh, <laughs> period of my life. And, uh, I, you know, I would say things about something too close to this balance of nature view. And they're really trying to demythologize a lot of things. They're trying to get rid of the idea that there's some kind of mystical uh, power of the whole over the part, and that you can over over reify the whole. You can over reify the part. You know, one of the problems is a lot of these idealist views get into uh, a, a, a kind of uh, reification or. Um, hypostasization of the whole to a degree that isn't, is, this is why they have this really good discussion of many to one and one to many relationships. And, you know, they discuss it in great detail and they also give some very good practical examples, which I really appreciate in, in, in this analysis. So they attack this um, Clementsian superorganism paradigm uh, its community is the expression of some general organizing principle, some balance or harmony of nature. The behavior of the parts is wholly subordinated to this abstract principle, which causes the community to develop toward the maximization of efficiency, productivity, stability, or some other civic virtue, which I guess is, is said ironically, you know, applying civic in a, um, a kind of... Uh, uh, well, an ironic sense where obviously that wouldn't apply. And, and then they attacked uh, the, the, the more reductionist computer models of systems ecology, which, which, uh, which really reduce everything to the parts and, and uh, you know, kind of collection of parts kind of view. So, so I think that's, that's helpful. I don't want to read all this stuff, but the bottom of that page, I think goes into some helpful detail. Um, and uh, on 136, around, you know, right, right at the beginning of the community is a dialectical whole. A dialectical materialism views the whole as a contingent structure in reciprocal interaction with its own part. So the whole is a contingent structure. So we're not going to take the whole as something as a kind of absolute with, uh, I mean, of course, you know, this is something we, we came across in Hegel. I mean, in a sense, we could say it's an absolute, according to some interpretations of Hegel's absolute, in, in which there's always contradiction within, within the whole, within the absolute. So, you know, I mean, this is what uh, Todd McGowan is, is, uh, has been writing about and talking about, a contradictory absolute. Well, I mean, in a certain sense, that's what the whole is. And it, it contains its own contradictions. It's not some fixed entity with its own laws of harmony and balance and everything else has to adhere to that. So in, eco in ecological theory, the community is an intermediate entity, the locus of species interaction between the local species population and the biogeographical region. And one thing that occurred to me when I was reading this stuff is that they don't use the term holon. And I was wondering, you know, to what extent would holon be useful here? In which in every uh, uh, entity or organism or or uh, uh, biotic uh, phenomenon, you can look at the ways in which it acts as a part toward a whole and also as as a whole toward other parts. Uh, so that's one of the things that I was uh, thinking about as I read this. Now, on 139. Uh, this is unfortunately long, but uh, they, they discuss the four aspects of, uh, of a dialectical materialist approach. And I mean, ordinarily, I wouldn't react terribly positively to people calling their theory dialectical materialist because it's such an abused term and has all kinds of baggage. But I really don't see a lot of problems with the way they do it. So, so on, on, uh, on 139 and 140, uh, a dialectical materialist approach assigns the following properties to the community. Okay, so there are four here, I believe, yes. First, the community is a contingent whole 
in reciprocal interaction with the lower and higher level halls and not completely determined by them. Sounds good to me. Second, some pro properties of the community level are definable for that level and are interesting objects of su study, regardless of how they are eventually explained. Among such properties are diversity, uh, equability, biomass, primary production, invasibility, which Charles might be interested in. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> yeah. what they do with, I don't know what they, they don't really say what they do with that. Uh, with that concept, but it would be interesting to know. And the patterning of food webs. And then they, they, so that's the second, they go on to the third on page 140, the properties of communities and the properties of the constituent populations are linked by many to one and one to many transformations, which I think is one of the most uh, interesting things they get into, um, in which they kind of explain what they're getting at. In you know, in the previous statements, um, uh, I don't want to read too much of this, but uh, they 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 give an example that I think is very helpful at the bottom of 140. It's one of the things I'm just so impressed by the fact that they do. You know, they they get into a really I think excellent theoretical analysis, but then they give us empirical evidence about how this works. So. Um, you know, there, 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 there are two things. Um, one, one of the, the many to one relationships are laws. They say at the uh, laws at uh, what many to one relationships, laws at the com community level are weak constraints on the parts. So that, so that the, the, what, 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 what happens on the community level does not destroy the diversity of the parts. And then uh, the one to many relationships, uh, they say, involve um, indeterminacy of higher levels. And that this example, I think, really helps us to understand what they're getting at, if, we, if you can bear with it for a minute. Um, okay. One-to-many relation of parts to whole reflects the fact that not all properties of the parts are specified by rules at the part level. For instance, habitat may specify that all species must be able to tolerate or avoid extreme heat. Okay? When this is a, whether this is accomplished by physiological tolerance, behavioral versatility in finding and staying in the cool spots, or dormancy during the hot, hot season is not deducible from the fact of heat. The mechanism depends on the past evolution of each species, yet it is of great importance in determining species interaction. So, so uh, you know, I find this, one thing I'm thinking about as I read this is um, how, does this, how does this apply to social theory? How can we use it in relation to social theory? And um, there was one particular analysis where it seemed to me that it became it became really evident how this works. So I'm gonna skip all this and, and see if I can find that. Yeah, it's not until page 158. And, and you know, I don't wanna spend a lot of people's time going over all of this, uh, but there, there's some very interesting analysis um, leading up to this, like on, on 156. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just glancing at it because there's so much in here. I, I, I found that the, the analysis of predator prey, uh, I, I don't know if you remember that, but uh, the simplest prey predator relations on page 156, after a little bit after the middle, predict that as there, I found this really helpful because actually we, we did a long hike today uh, to the center of the village. I mean, we're supposedly in a village, but there's no village here. There's just like houses really far apart. So we were told that if we walked uh, like uh, two miles, we would be to the center of the village, but it was, it was more like eight miles, but we finally got there. But it was a very hot, <laughs> strenuous afternoon. It took us three hours to walk to the village and back. But but we, my son Brian pointed out that there was a, a thing that looked like a fly trap 
um, which it wasn't, though he looked more carefully. It, it might have been, we, we weren't sure why somebody was doing this, like out, out in the countryside, but it was somebody collecting some kind of insects or, uh, or something like that. So we got into a discussion of predator prey and, um, and also uh, like um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the richness and diversity of species and all of that. And how, how, like what would happen if you caught a certain amount of the insects? It would probably, what would happen is, I mean, this was purely hypothetical. It wasn't even what was happening, but there were, there were a lot of flies in the area. Apparently there's a hog farm somewhere out there and they produce all kinds of flies that infest everything. But what if you did try to catch the flies, like to reduce the number of flies in an area? Well, it would work. Uh, for the very immediate area, but it really wouldn't wouldn't make much difference because as soon as you reduce the number of flies in a certain area, it would make it prime territory for other flies to migrate in. So it would become pretty much the way it was before. And I, but I was thinking the reason why I was thinking about that is because of their analysis of predator prey and density of species and all of these other uh, all, all of these other issues. So the simplest prey-predator relations predict that as prey increase, there will be a consequent increase in predators. So the correlation between prey and predator should be positive. However, as predators increase, all other things being equal, prey should decrease. So there will be a negative correlation in abundance. The spiral nature of the dynamics in the two-dimensional prey-predator space shows us immediately that prey and predator abundances may be either positively or negatively correlated depending on where in the spiral the populations are historically. Well, I mean, one thing we can learn from this is when we look at social phenomena, we have to, I mean, ultimately it says, I, I'll tell you one thing that it, it helps us understand that we have to look at everything in geohistory. We have to look at the big picture. We have to look at the, the large, movements of, of, uh, of, of, of uh, you know, basically the history of the earth and see how phenomena fit into that. But even on, on more, you know, micro levels or less macro levels, let's see, say we, it's so common in non-dialectical thinking not to look at these, you know, spirals or, or reciprocal relationships and where you are in the evolution of those relationships. So a lot of this is just good practice in dialectical thinking. So I, what I really wanted to point out, though, is uh, was on page 158, I believe. Um, so there, there's a passage that impressed me uh, at the top of 158. And I'm not going to say much more about this because I, I really don't want to talk too much, but I just wanted to point out a few of these uh, passages just to look at the text a bit. Um, because I'm very, I'm very skeptical of discussions that don't stick to the text because it's easy to make claims about people, but if you look at what they say carefully, it's kind of more fair to them, I think. Um, the outcome of this analysis, of course, this jumps into the middle of the discussion, but the out outcome of this analysis is that the correlation between a pair of variables, even in the simplest ecosystem, depends first of all on the rest of the structure of the system. Second, on the variable at which the external source of variation enters the system. Third, on the history of the system. And finally, on the duration of observation. That's really the point. Therefore, no observed correlation pattern between physical conditions and biological variables. And of course, you know, their big theme here, you know, like in uh, social theory, there's all this like vague kind of discussion of nature versus nurture, right? Well, I mean, they would kind of predict that if you start out with that kind of nature versus nurture, you're going to get in a lot of trouble because it isn't versus. But they also say another thing that's interesting in their in their chapter, uh, the the, uh, the section on additive an additive view. Well, why don't you just put nature and nurture together, and and show how both of them affect things? 
The problem is it's always too complex because there's a reciprocal interaction. There's a dialectical interaction. Nature and, and nurture are changing each other all the time. You can't just add them up and come up with an answer. I was impressed by that. You know, about that, that analysis, about the, attacking the additive view. Okay, so, so um, no observed correlation pattern between physical conditions and biological variables can refute the view of a mutual determination of species and ecosystems, even when physical measurements alone can give good predictions of abundance or change. You know, it goes on. There's a lot, there's a lot in here. I mean, I really think the discussion on 159 of uh, the failure of the do dominant philosophy of, of science regarding complexity was very good. And, you know, there are four points there. It's reductionist, it neglects interaction, it neglects properties of complex wholes, and it's atomistic, which kind of overlaps. But what I'm getting at is that I think everything that they're saying about biology is extremely valuable in analyzing social phenomena. I mean, I see a parallel on everything they say. So this is why I think, I mean, I, I was kind of shocked that people were saying at the beginning, before, well, when my phone was going off and on and I probably didn't he hear half of what you were saying, but it sounded like people were wondering about the relevance of this. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of amazed after, what is it, over 40 years they wrote this, there've been a lot of books that supposedly were doing dialectical analysis that I don't think are nearly as helpful as this one. Yeah, I mean, um, I know that was kind of chaotic, but I, I hope it helped. Um, but I, what I what I was talking about at the beginning, I don't think was necessarily like a outright criticism of what they're trying to do per se. But I think I was trying to point out, or at least ask the question to figure out if this is what's happening or not, mm -hmm. that uh, they might in fact be implicated in their own critique. Um, in the sense that what they're trying to do with dialectical materialism is to set up a dichotomy between idealism and materialism, which is not part of like what, you know, there were the dialectical project is, is uh, really about, at least from what Marx was doing. Um, and to postulate that what they're critiquing is idealistic, I could see leading to problems in the sense that, um, you know, what might, I mean, of course, you're saying dialectical materialism is a lot of baggage and it's appropriated in many ways. But of course, um, where I did see this applied recently came from like a Science for the People article, the guy that wrote it, like does the Midwestern Marx thing. So it's a very like Leninist group. But then if you run down that line, um, what I see happening in that thing is kind of like an empiricism you know like a scientific empiricism or even looking at like scientific marxism is like scientific method marxism which is like not what you know that term i think was originally appropriated for but yeah i mean like uh to put forward you know an opposition between idealism and materialism and then to uh uh, have idealism and abstraction and saying that Newton, like they, what did they say? They said Newton on page 150 uh, was perfectly conscious of the process of abstraction and idealization he had undertaken. Well, mm -hmm. does this not also take Newton out of his own context? Because Newton, like I was saying this, uh, I think when you're off, but Newton's two thirds of what he wrote was religious in nature he was trying to find like the math in the bible you know he was like practicing alchemy um so like i mean i guess does that apply to what he's saying here that you know basically I think they're talking about when he didn't practice alchemy right but i mean i mean yeah it's a critic it's a point about what he does theoretically in physics mm -hmm. which may or may not be true but it isn't a claim that all, you know, that Newton didn't do other things, is it? And uh, the other thing is that I would ask you about um, is when, when they, they juxtapose uh, um, 
materialist reductionism and dialectical idealism. And um, they say what they're talking about. You know, they do, do, they do a critique of idealism and they give an example, which isn't Hegel. It's, um, I, I, I had mentioned it earlier where, where they give their example uh, of what they're attacking. And uh, does anybody remember the page? Uh, yeah, it's, it's on uh, page 135, uh, Clement, Clementsian, Clements, Clements, Clement, Clementsian superorganism paradigm, which is idealist. And, um, you know, I, I, um, it doesn't necessarily apply to everything that everybody has ever called idealism. Um, but, but, they're 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 attacking a certain error. Um, by the way, I, this afternoon uh, my friend Michael Pelius uh, called me, and uh, we talked a little bit about this. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, came to mind when we were talking is that Whitehead had this idea of the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. And uh, a lot of what they're doing, you know, to make something into more of an entity than it is, or more of a reality than it is, and not seeing, you know, well, part of it is not seeing the, you know, some of their best examples are not seeing the constructed nature of an abstraction, including the abstraction of something being a whole. You know, we have to see how in, they, they point out that in science, you often get what you're looking for. And you have to include in your understanding of it, that aspect of it, that it's it's an artifact based on what you're looking for. And you can't make it more than that. And uh, their criticism of idealism is often that, that what they think of as idealism is makes it more than that. It makes it into a, a force greater than it is and a, a, a determinant greater than it is. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, so I, I, I don't think they, like they've refuted every form of idealism by, by uh, attacking certain forms of idealism. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, like, so I just, you know, I, I, I'm i like, again, I'm not necessarily like railing on them or, or, you know, saying that I'm just part of this is like me trying to figure out what it is that they're trying to do. And like, is that like, so what maybe I read into this and I was just trying to figure this out um, with what they're suggesting. Are they not like on 152? This was a thing that made me have questions um right before stochasticity stochasticity tisticity, whatever and statistics it says um the last paragraph what distinguishes mm. abstractions from ideals is that abstractions are epistemological questions of the Wait, attempt to order that's on 152 uh on what i'm reading yeah it's before stochasticity and statistics okay yeah Oh, what to say? Um, yeah, I got so, it. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so it seems like this is kind of like what they're getting at. Um, abstractions are epistemological consequences of the attempt to order and predict real phenomena, while ideas are regarded as ontologically prior to their manifestation in objects. So are they right. saying here that um, the abstraction is sort of the mental construct that is appropriated from a testing of, you know, the that which is out there, while the ideal is um, sort of this categorical, like, imperative or whatever you call it, like the, well, I don't know. I'd say it's more like a platonic idea. That's what the ideal is. For yeah, them. I, a lot of this, when I read it, I, I sort of... I really strongly had the feeling that Platonism was uh, lurking in the background. I mean, they kind of attack it directly at a few points where they talk about um, a certain type of idealism that 
remember the discussion where they uh, it was about uh, astronomy where where the the um, you know the the heavenly bodies uh, move in a certain way but the, it it turns out to be so not so not you know not uh, mathematically perfect as people used to want it to be so so they come up with a hypothesis that somehow there's a there is a perfect body and what we see is a kind of imperfect manifestation of that perfect body you remember that discussion um, well, that's a platonic view. And they're saying there are no such things. But very few people believe that there's like a, 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 a perfect Jupiter, you know, <laughs> out in space. There's, a, there's somehow a hidden perfect Jupiter and the, the actual phenomenon of Jupiter is not the real Jupiter. It's just this like imperfect manifestation. I mean, right. who would believe that? But what they're saying is some people in science write as if, express themselves as if they do believe something like that. Yeah. Which I thought was a good point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that makes more sense as to what they were getting at. I mean, it would be a kind of idealist science, while the ultimate empiricist science is human, Humean science, you know, in the, in the tradition of David Hume, in which everything is just a generalization based on what we happen to have, have, have experienced. And, you know, uh, so Hume would say there is no necessity that the sun is going to rise tomorrow. It's just that we have confidence that it will based on habit. We have a habit of expectation of certain things. It's a, it's a kind of psychological fact that we do expect things to happen as they have in the past. But we have no knowledge of any necessity or all that laws are or statistical generalizations about what's what we've experienced in the past. That would be the you know extreme empiricist science, which they're attacking. Mm -hmm. I think that settles the matter for me. <laughs> That's always dangerous. Uh, if I could make another comment, my one of the my my friend Michael, uh, who joined us, I think he joined one yeah. of the groups mm -hmm. once. It was this one, right? When we were talking yeah. about um, uh, uh, Bernard Stiegler, whom he yes. is mm -hmm. really you know pretty much of an expert on. Um, he, uh, what what am I what am I saying about it? Oh yeah, he he's very familiar with this book and. Uh, he said when he's taught this book already, and he has the, his students read our next reading, which are the human the human nature uh, chapter, and then the uh, the conclusion. And uh, so, I mean, maybe we should have done that, but we didn't. But he says that really helps you to understand where they're going. They kind of tell you so much at the end about where they're going. And uh, I remember that's when we originally decided what we were going to read. I wanted to make sure we did we we didn't leave out the human relation, I mean the human nature part, and just jump to the conclusion. Um, so so I mean I really think that'll help next time. You, you're, saying that, you're saying that you're saying that when when Michael teaches teaches it, he begins with those two chapters. With the end. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he begins yeah. With the end. <laughs> And I mean, somebody in this group said, uh, you know, that uh, uh, it seems like a, um, somebody had looked through the book and uh, it seemed like it's kind of hard to get some of it looking at these chapters. But then if you if you skip to the end, you can kind of see more. 
or I can't remember who said that, maybe Tony or somebody, I don't know, who might have looked at the end. <laughs> But you know, I, I it's good to bear with with people. Just a couple questions I want to raise. <clears throat> um, what does this book tell us about um, alienation and mm. about morality? Um, as I understand the concept of alienation, there needs to be some kind of nature that you're alienated from, uh, whether it's a human nature or non-human nature. So maybe we'll get more to this um, in the chapter on human nature, but it's just a question I have. Um, where, where does alienation fit in here? The other is about um, morality. And I'm looking at the a pseudo um, anonymous letter that they wrote um, critiquing Dawkins and Wilson. Mm -hmm. And this is on page 128. And it seems that they're, so this goes into their critique of reductionism. And they point out that, you know, Wilson on one hand says that neurobiology provides a genetically accurate code of ethics. And on the other hand, he warns against the naturalistic fallacy. Yeah. Dawkins, on one hand, says that we're robot vehicles of selfish genes, and the other hand, we should try to be good. And so they are kind of baffled by the, these contradictions. And um, I definitely can go along with their uh, dismantling of the uh, of these uh, reductionist scientists. But I'm I'm wondering, you know, how does this book give us uh, not just an understanding of nature, but a um, and ethics of, of, of nature and environmental ethics. If, if that's what they're, if, you know, if, if that's what one, one aim of the book um, at all. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think it is, but that doesn't mean there isn't anything there. I think there is something there, but, um, I, I, I was thinking about that issue as I read it, and uh, I wrote a note about it in relation to page 144. But, but just to mention, uh, going back to Wilson, uh, uh, Wilson wrote an article uh, on ethics once, and I haven't looked at it in many years but it was one of the worst things I have ever seen. And it was, such, it was like, a, it was like a, a paradigm example of somebody in one field trying to do something in another field that they had no conception of, that they had never studied it. They didn't know how it worked. They didn't know what the concepts were. They made na naive blunders, all of that. Uh, it, would be, it, it might even be instructive to try to look it up sometime. Because he, he, did, he didn't write that much directly about ethics, but I, I remember just the I, horror at reading that article. Um, and uh, I, another, another, I, I, used to, uh, I used to teach, I had to teach a course uh, many years ago on called Philosophy of Human Nature. I used to use the B.F. Skinner's book, Walden II, and, uh, uh, which is a, a weird book. And it's, kind of is a terrible uh, co-optation of, of Walden, but uh, he, he gets into ethics at uh, a certain point and he says, well, uh, what's right and wrong is, is, is an experimental question. It's basically science can answer it. And uh, the only way it answers it by, is by, you know, begging the question in, in, the, in, the, in the technical sense of that fallacy. Um, but but uh, what I saw on page 144. Um, I guess it was in reference to the the uh, the the bottom paragraph on 144. I don't remember exactly what I was thinking, but 
He says, finally, the way, or they say, the finally, the way in which a change in some physical parameter or genetic characteristic of a population affects the other populations in the community depends both on the individual properties of each species and on the way the community is structured. This is perhaps the critical claim of community ecology. Well, they're not talking about ethical issues at all. But what occurred to me is that if you want to look at ethical issues, you should do what they're doing. And, and uh, I, I really suggest that the group look at some of Holmes Ralston's writings. He's one of the foremost so-called environmental uh, philosophers of the United States. He's still around as far as I know. Um, and he wrote a book called Environmental Ethics, which was not a textbook, but it was actually a, a very detailed, careful analysis of, of value, of you know, right, wrong, good, evil, and valuing uh, in relation to the natural world. And um, he's very important for having come up with the concept of systemic value, which I think is really a dialectical uh, uh, concept of value. And one of the things that he looks at, you know, he has a really strong background in uh, science and biology and ecology. And um, he, he looks at how uh, value operates on the level of the organism, the species, the ecosystem, the biosphere. We can also bring in, for instance, populations. Uh, we could even look at the suborganic level. Uh, I mean, if, we re if we're really serious about these issues, that's what we have to do. Um, you know, we can even look at every level of being and, and raise value questions. So um, I think this analysis of nature, of, of uh, ecosystems, of uh, relationships within ecosystems, is very helpful in trying to answer value questions, even though they don't do it. I mean, that's, that would be my real answer. They don't do it, but they give us a way of thinking that when we enter the sphere of value, it can help us understand the complexity of how value emerges. And you know what they ultimately, what, what Ralston ultimately gets at is this concept of systemic value in which value is in, in, in um, it's, there's another uh, fallacy that uh, Whitehead talks about, which is the, which is the fallacy of simple location. And uh, Rawson's great on this because he says, "Don't I don't like the term he uses." He says, "Look at value is smeared out." I don't like smeared out, but uh, uh, the idea that value is not something that is just located, you know, like focused, like condensed into individual organisms. But value is something that's going on in organisms, it's going on in populations, it's going on in species, it's going on in ecosystems, it's going on in biomes, it's going on in the biosphere. And there are all kinds of interactions between whole and part and greater whole and greater part and greater whole. And also, so it's a horizontal and vertical kind of interaction in which value emerges. And you can't understand how value is going to emerge, for instance, unless you look like in, in the individuals and in the species, unless you look at what's going on within the ecosystem, like what are the qualities of the ecosystem that are, that are, that like nurture value in individuals and species. And then you can shift that to human communities also and see how that kind of, you know, complex interaction takes place between individuals, families, groups, various types of communities and the larger community. So I guess what I'm saying is there are certain things that are implicit here. I mean, they, they don't write about alienation at all, really. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, 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 I don't know, maybe other people saw some things that are relevant to that question.
I got too caught up and confused in the stuff I was talking about earlier. So I didn't, <laughs> I wasn't as focused on these questions. Do you think that their critique of Clements and the superorganism paradigm um, applies to what scientists now refer to as the earth system and to, uh, to Gaia? Of course, those aren't interchangeable terms, but I think they're closely related. Is is that maybe part of what they're getting at when they when they talk about idealism, or or is Clements um, just oh, something God. totally separate? Wow, a lot of people are not talking. Okay, well, I wouldn't know how to answer that question. I have to know more about uh, what the Earth systems people are, are really claiming to see how close they are. So I wouldn't try to answer that. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Nobody. I wonder if we could maybe just maybe wrap it up. And uh, these these last two chapters, I think, are gonna gonna really fill us in on a lot more about what they're doing. Would that be okay? Um, yeah, yeah, we could do that. Um, uh, before Since we tarantula is eating. I think I might go eat. It's nine thirty here. <laughs> Uh, we well not not Seems to like we're winding down. <laughs> well, not not to uh, uh, poop the party here, but do, uh, do we want to try to figure out reading 